Hey, I'm Mel. And I'm Andres, and you're listening to Mixtape, Mixtape, your favorite Afro-Latin podcast. What she said. The Mixtape podcast aims to build awareness of the way racist behaviors and ideas manifest in the Afro-Latin dance scene. Follow us on Instagram at mixtape.podcast and click our link tree in the bio to learn more. Today's track is inspired by the song Yo Soy El Merengue, I Am the Merengue, paying homage to the contributions of the late Johnny Ventura, El Caballo Mayor, one of the greatest merengueros to live and who passed away this July during the construction of this episode. Today, we're listening to Caña Brava, Tough Cane, by Tonio Abreu and Hipólito Martínez, performed here by the king of merengue, Joseito Mateo. Joseito was an Afro-Dominican singer born in 1920 in the outskirts of Santo Domingo. He began his artistic career in the 1930s singing boleros and son cubano. In 1947, Joseito became a staff musician of the official state radio station La Voz de Yuna the voice of Juno. And just one year later, he became the vocalist of Super Orquesta San Jose, a merengue band favored by Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo during the 1950s. Caña Brava is a classic, popular merengue song. It is said to have been originally composed in the late 1920s as an advertisement for a rum company by the name of Brugal. Caña Brava tells a simple story about a drop in the supply of sugarcane following a fire in one of the settlements of sugarcane workers. Joseito sings, Se acabó la caña, se acabó el moler, porque en Montellano se quemó un batey. There's no more sugarcane, there's no more grinding cane, because in Montellano, a batey went in flames. Montellano is a municipality located in the province of Puerto Plata in the Dominican Republic, a region where sugar plantations have been historically common. Bate, in the song, refers to the often precarious settlements of sugarcane workers who were mostly black and often Haitian. Joseito continues, Voy a montar un molino en la carretera, pa' moler mi caña de 20 maneras. I'm going to set up a sugarcane grinder in the street, to grind my sugarcane in 20 different ways. Some of my research in economics is in the field of entrepreneurship, so I really like these lines. As the bate goes in flames and the sugar mill stops operating, the character in the song is ready to put his own street sugarcane grinder and make a business out of it, displaying an invigorating entrepreneurial disposition. And before I let you go, a little gem for my salseros y salseras out there. It turns out that El Gran Combo de Puerto Rico was assembled initially as a backing band for Joseito, who sang in the first LP of the band in 1962 entitled El Gran Combo con Joseito Mateo, including the song Meneame los Mangos, Shake Your Mangos for Me. Yep, you got it, it's a classic double entendre. If you're curious about the song or about Jose Tomateo, check our sources for this episode. Welcome to the episode number 5 of our second season, Yo Soy El Merengue. I am the Merengue. This is Mixtape. <laughs> Welcome to the Mixtape podcast and thank you for joining us on our rhythm season. We took a brief intermission this summer. I don't know, maybe we can call it an intermission. So if you are a regular listener, then welcome back. And if you are listening for the first time, you should know that in this season, we explore different Afro-Latin and African rhythms we encounter while social dancing. In one episode, we discuss a rhythm, and in the subsequent Were You Listening episode, we feature a song with the associated rhythm. That's right. We discuss the history of the rhythm as well as the movement associated with it, and we discuss how we can continue to center and recognize its black Afro-Latin roots. 
Before our intermission, we produced episodes on samba, the universe of Afro-Cuban rhythms, the blend of rhythms known as salsa, bachata, and this month, we are sticking around in the Dominican Republic because the rhythm we're talking about is... Merengue! merengue. Now, merengue is a special kind of rhythm for Andres and I. I feel like we say this a lot with salsa, but if you were at a Puerto Rican or Colombian party in the 90s, you would be hearing merengue play. As we were constructing this episode, Andres mentioned that his family parties were like 50-50, salsa and merengue. But my family parties, I feel like, were more like 75-25 in that ratio. Is that so? Well, my sister made sure that she corrected me. She thinks it's 50-50 too, but I remember merengue dominating the playlist of the dance music. Even today at family parties, you'll get some sprinkles of merengue. For sure. Not only family parties. All my teenage parties, when I was trying and failing to pick up girls, we were dancing to Recarena, Los Hermanos Rosario, La Máquina, and most definitely, we were dancing that merengue hip hop by Sandy Papo and Proyecto Uno. Dime si son latinos. So, in track four, we focused on bachata. But before bachata gained in popularity in the Dominican Republic, the Caribbean, the United States, and beyond, merengue was a powerhouse of a rhythm and has officially been named the national rhythm of the Dominican Republic for 75 years. I don't know, Mel. Some bachateros might fight you on that one nowadays. Mm, show me them hands. <laughs> now, merengue is a little different from some of our other rhythms in that we don't hear it as much in the social dance scene anymore, as we might hear rhythms like salsa and bachata. When DJs do play merengue, there seems to be a split that happens where the Latin American and Latinx dancers swarm to the floor to dance merengue in sick of those treasure, childhood and teenage memories. At the same time, studio dancers step aside and take a break until the salsa bachata rotation comes back. Have you ever seen that meme on um, Instagram or Facebook where Spongebob is running to the dance floor and it has like some merengue song and he's running over there? I've never seen such thing. Oh my gosh, I you have to see. I'm going to have to post this I on can, his website. I can think of my, of. of the Spongebob dancing <laughs> merengue, that's just, that's just not. <laughs> Given this experience in the social dancing, what we learned about merengue in our research for the bachata episode, as well as our affinity for the rhythm, we wanted to explore its larger sociopolitical and cultural context and how it has evolved over time. To do that, we heard from three great guests. First, we met with Socrates Garcia, who is an Afro-Dominican professor at the University of Northern Colorado, a music producer, recording and mixing engineer, arranger, composer, and band leader. Honestly, what can he do? Socrates offers a wealth of information about the history of merengue. If you go to when merengue was born, it was very close to the independence. Uh, in February 27th, 18, 1844, was our independence. So the first mention of merengue was actually uh, very close to that. It was a, a newspaper, the Oasis. And this newspaper, that was in 1857, was, they were complaining about the merengue, about what, what that was. Why was that? Because before that, before merengue came you know, in, into into being, let's say, most of the dances that happened in the in the DR were European based. You know, contra dance. Uh, there was one that was called tumba, which is the one that actually was replaced by merengue, and that was a big problem for them. Why? Because tumba was more like a group dance kind of thing, and they touched hands only. So for the intellectuals at the time, seeing two people dancing like the way they were dancing plus the double meaning of the lyrics was not acceptable. So they started attacking merengue, and that was the first time that name, that name of merengue was actually mentioned. It was in the Oasis in November 26, 1857. Merengue was born at that time, and it became, actually, it's funny, it began in the urban centers, but the intellectuals were against it. So beginning in 57, you had the first attack, let's say, but that kept going on the, until the 70s, 1870s. And that's when pretty much merengue was relegated to the countryside. That's when actually what was supposed to be a bad thing 
became the best thing for merengue. Because that's when, it, when the, the, what, what we call merengue typical was born in, in a region of Dominican Republic that is called El Cibao, which is actually where, I, where I'm from. There was a huge amount of people playing that in the countryside. Even the term, the name Perico Ripia, which is the, the, the other name for, for merengue typical, you can tell where it came from. It was the name of a brother. So that music, like bachata later on, was not um, accepted at the beginning. It was, and then it wasn't. And then it was not until later that it became um, what we know today as, as the national music of the Dominican Republic. When I said it began in the urban centers, then it was relegated to the countryside. Now, remember, now we, we've been playing this kind of music for 30 years or more in the countryside. Now, we had a dictator, Rafael Leonidas Trujillo. Trujillo was president in 1930, right? 1930 until 1961. What happened, he loved Merengue Típico. But Merengue Típico was kind of the second class kind of music. So the people that scorned him, he needed a way to get revenge. He needed a way to, for payback. And he said, you know what? I'm going to make this music the national music of the Dominican Republic. And he did it by decree in 1936. By decree, he said, I'm going to do this music, the, the, our music. Lo mío no es nuevo, no es cosa de ahora. Yo soy merenguero, hasta la tambora. Lo mío no es nuevo, no es cosa de ahora. I think as someone born and raised in the United States, it's sometimes hard to understand how a country can decide to make a genre of music its national rhythm. I mean, you guys have country music, right? Mm, let's not talk about that. <laughs> Alongside Socrates, our guest John Bimbiras, a PhD student in ethnomusicology, teacher and musician currently at the University of Texas at Austin, walked us through how dictator Rafael Trujillo made this happen. First, he brought a merengue band with him along the campaign trail um, during his, like, the, the presidential election of 19, 1930. And then he would use a merengue band at each, like, state function, you know, at, at each um, time he would host a party, there would be a merengue orchestra playing there. And in 1936, he contracted his own merengue orchestra, Orquesta Generalissimo Trujillo, or the Orquesta Presidente Trujillo. And so they would play wherever he told them to. So he personally sponsored them. His brother had his own um, merengue orchestra as well. So it was directly sponsored by the state. There was a lot of propaganda. I see. Uh, there was documented maybe over 500, at least 500 merengues written in honor of Trujillo. Um, and, you know, and it wasn't enough just to be, to not be anti-Trujillo. You had to write pro-Trujillo merengues on a regular basis to prove your loyalty. And so in that way, like if you wanted to have a career and you wanted to be a musician, you pretty much, I guess, you know, you had to toe the line or else, you know, go in exile yeah. or get killed, you know, so it's, um, it's a tough choice, you know. Getting back to like the early period, like the merengue was kind of seen as this like scandalous dance because of its close embrace of the partners, the hip movement, kind of simulating like the sexual act. And so it was considered to be like low class particularly for this reason, you know, it was like eschewed by like the elites. They, they didn't want it to be performed in the ballrooms, but eventually during the U.S. occupation of 1916, um, the Marines invade the Dominican Republic and there creates this kind of patriotic fervor. So the merengue kind of turns around and becomes kind of a tool of patriotic uh, nationalistic pride, whereas before it was kind of like a backwards, like country music, you know, and not acceptable in like elite society. Trujillo tried to deny the African uh, roots of merengue. He tried to whiten the country for sure, but he was part Haitian himself. And he also in secret practiced Dominican Afro, Dominican religion, uh, I guess, you know, what they call voodoo in private. And he liked to dance merengue, which is Afro Dominican music. So it's kind of like, even though they don't talk about it, it's still right out there in the open. Hay muchas mujeres que no salen solas y son merengueras hasta la tambora. Hay muchas mujeres que no salen solas y son merengueras hasta la tambora.
both the dictatorship and the death of Trujillo had implications for how artists interpreted the rhythm in their music and dance. Socrates shares more about this and how the rhythm continued to develop from the 60s through the 2000s. One, another thing Trujillo did, he founded a, a radio station, radio TV station, like a huge, you know, network. It was called La Voz Dominicana, the Dominican voice. In La Voz Dominicana, you could hear at the same time or the same day, Merengue Típico, and then a big band right after. At the time, the big bands were the, the huge thing. That was more salon dance, you know, for big uh, events. And then you had the Merengue Típico on the side. That was, again, now brought to the capital. Now we are back to the urban. When Trujillo died, that was 1961, May 30th, 1961. It was a big change, of course. First, it was, um, it was a matter of not being able to keep the big bands financially because it was impossible. But it was also a, a more a, the stance of, I don't want to do that because that is related to what Trujillo did. That's when the compost come in. Actually, you had Johnny Ventura, who was the first superstar in the world from Merengue. He died last week. Johnny and his compost show, that was the name of the band. So we're talking 60s. Mid-60s is when Johnny Ventura came out, and he changed everything. Now, it was smaller ensembles. The lyrics were more about having fun and things like that, mostly. Uh, it was not about Trujillo anymore. It was about other things, like La Garradera. That's one of the, of the classic tunes Johnny used to sing. It was fun music. Now, we had a totally different kind of deal, because now the big bands were influenced by jazz. A lot of the musicians were jazz musicians that came out from, from you know, that tradition and playing merengue, including one of our greatest saxophonists of all time, Tavito Vasquez. He was getting those jazz elements into the merengue typical kind of thing. One of my pieces, actually, I use one of his solos in all of my pieces, yeah? It's called Homage to Tavito. He was a virtuoso player. Um, it's funny that a lot of the young kids today don't know about him, but Tavito was, Tavito changed the, the way we played merengue on you know, saxophone. <laughs> In the 70s, there was another name that came out that was huge, that was also fusing stuff. It was Wilfredo Vargas. Wilfredo is, is the figure of the 70s, let's say. What Johnny was in the 60s and became this huge superstar, Wilfredo was in the 70s. Now, in the 80s, also, we have one more name that came out and changed everything, who is Juan Luis Guerra. Juan Luis came out in the 80s from Berkeley College of Music and changed everything. And the reason why he changed everything is because he saw the void. He saw that merengue was the style about, you know, 5-1, kind of very simple harmonically, and a very simple thing. The, the, the 80s, it's what is called the golden era of the merengue, of merengue. Why? Because so many styles came out of that, that era, and so many great artists that we still have today. And I'll go to hip hop. In a minute. Uh, Juan Luis was the one that, when I say changed everything, and uh, not only merengue, but also bachata, he created a new style. Basically, he came with all the jazz and rock kind of vibe. And that was a, an interesting conjunction, let's say, at that point. Because not only Juan Luis, we had Manuel Tejada. He's probably the most important merengue arranger in history. He has arranged over 4,000 songs. But Manuel and Juan Luis were very close friends. They were talking about how to do things. 
Now, Juan Luis comes, and he comes from Berkeley with his jazz influences and rock influences, and writes an album, arranges an album. It was vocal jazz with merengue rhythm, basically. The album is called Soplando. It's the first for 40 album. Now, Juan Luis was the big change from merengue. It was more stylized or stylized, let's say. It was same for bachata. He took bachata and put it in the world. And that's why we have bachata in the, the spot we had it today. We have it today because Juan Luis took care of it. They took that rhythm, added synthesizers, nice vocal harmonies, lyrics that were not indecent, and that changed everything. On 80s was merengue, you know, Eddie Herrera, Wilfrido, Juan Luis, Sergio, Los Hermanos Rosario, all of that was uh, 80s. 90s coming. Now it's a time of a newer generation, let's say. Pavel de Jesus, Winton de Jesus, that, that group from New York, they were working on rap albums in Quad Studios. And they said, what if we try this rap hip hop thing with a merengue rhythm on, underneath? And that's how this came about. There was one arranger that died about four years ago, three years ago, maybe, Victor Weil, who became the, the predominant arranger for that style of music. What was that? In the 90s, that was the predominant style of, of music. But at the time, that became the, you know, it was a, a concert kind of thing. It was not, not for dancing only. It was for dancing, of course, it's merengue. But it had the, the merengue rhythm section underneath, and then the hip hop kind of vibe on top. I mean, you have a, it had a rapper on top, and that was Ilegales, Proyecto Uno. Furanito, which was like more like like merengue typical and um, and and hip hop. Proyecto Uno was one of them. Factor X, that was another band from that was from Ilegales. And that style became the like I said the predominant style in in Latin America at the time, more than everybody else. So the hip hop was the big thing in the in the nineties. Now, when, when the 2000s came, that's when I moved to the United States. I don't know what happened with merengue in general. What they have now, influenced by, well, a lot of the Puerto Rican reggaeton and all that stuff, my opinion as a musician and as a, you know, is that they should call it something else and not merengue at this point. Because it, it's, it doesn't have the elements that are, you know, merengue. <laughs> Now that we know about the history of merengue, we wanted to get into the musical influences. Merengue, uh, the typical trio of a merengue is supposed to represent the tri-ethnic makeup of the Dominican Republic. So you have the accordion representing the European, you know, the, the accordion comes from Germany and was brought there by German like tobacco traders in the 1870s. You have the tambora, which is like the African, the drum, and then you have the guira, which is supposed to represent the indigenous, you know, it's the scraper, the, originally a gourd scraper, and then eventually they used metal. And so it's supposed to kind of like harmoniously represent the triethnic na- makeup of the Dominican Republic. Now, scholar, or especially early scholars of merengue disavowed like any connection to Africa, at times bending over backwards to kind of say that any influence was probably, you know, indigenous Indian influence in the music. Um, of course, that's been disproved in, at length, you know, in the past, the latter half of the 20th century. But that was definitely kind of like the prevailing like thought on it, I guess, at the time, especially like even people like Luis Alberti, who was Trujillo's main merenguero, denied any African influence in the merengue. But there obviously is. <laughs> In today's episode, we have another great guest. We have Edwin Ferreras, 
an Afro-Dominican music and dancer educator, composer, arranger, and producer. He is the co-founder of Areito Arts alongside his partner Dakota Romero. According to their website, the name of the company refers to the Taino rhythm, song, dance, and gathering through which history is told and passed down. Edwin walked us not only through the musical influences, but also the movement in merengue and the importance of centering blackness. The main musical influences of merengue would be um, its predecessor, Tumba. Tumba is, uh, was the national music of the Dominican Republic uh, prior to merengue becoming the national music now. Um, merengue draws a lot also from Habanera, which is an older Cuban style that gave rise to things like danzón. Um, it also has a lot of influences of balsier. Uh, balsier is both an instrument and also a rhythm uh, that's found in a lot of Haitian music, specifically uh, music like gaga, um, ra ra in, in Haiti. Uh, it, it has a little bit of zouk influence as well. Um, however, because merengue, when it first developed as a style, um, it was played with guitars, um, merengue de guitarra or merengue, eh, merengues de cuerda. Uh, that style is not the one that became the most popular. So over the years, it's been growing in, in terms of influences from other styles. Uh, but the main influences, I think, would be music from Haiti and, of course, the, 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 the guitar music of Spain. Um, mainly because it was played in guitars originally. I'm pretty sure it has, it has a lot more influences like um, Palo, which is another Afro-Caribbean style based on Yoruba land traditions in, in Nigeria and Congo, and Bata, the Bata rhythms. But it's harder to trace those particular influences in today's merengue unless you're only listening to the tambora, which is where you get a lot more of the African rhythms there. Given that it is hard to trace this, we wondered how Edwin has managed to learn about these musical influences. It's hard to find any documentation of tumba today. Uh, tumba is a rhythm from South America, I believe is either uh, from Venezuela or Colombia. Um, and because a lot of our history is tied into the Arawak cultures of Venezuela, a lot of our rhythms and our instruments are also very um, indigenously influenced. But I feel that from my understanding of how tumba came to be, tumba became a national rhythm because of its popularity and not because of its Dominican identity with the, with the rhythm. With merengue, it was the opposite. It became nationalized because of its, it became the identity of Dominican people. But tumba, uh, because it was not a partner dance, it didn't become as popular as merengue being a partner dance. It became the, the dance of taboo. Everyone wanted to hold hands with each other. Um, but it's really hard to find records and documentation about how tumba came to be even accepted in the Dominican Republic, something coming from South America. We asked Edwin to walk us through some of the important rhythms that exist in merengue and how someone can recognize their differences. So when we're talking about the rhythms and the, the styles, um, we have to also draw a distinction between what are the styles and, and rhythms that the industry recognizes, and then what are the ones that are found more in the in in the in el pueblo, in the town, you know, and from people's day to day living. So, for instance, like when you say merengue hip hop, which also went by merengue rock, um, also went by merengue pop. There were so many different variants to describe what was happening in New York when you had merengue fusing with things like hip hop, rock, R&B, especially like Fulanito, which was one of the biggest artists that made these fusions. But that rhythm was never recognized by the industry. So it was always labeled as tropical. Um, merengue and bachata music coming out would be labeled either tropical or various, which was the, the biggest slap in the face because like, wait a minute, we have our own rhythms where you refuse to recognize them. Um, but from the ones that are recognized in the Dominican Republic as a style of their own, there are only basically three, uh, which would be your merengue típico, merengue popular, or merengue de orquesta, which uh, are often one and the same, and merengue urbano. Um, and the urbano uh, has, it also goes by another name, which is mambo, but it's not used often in the industry because mambo also has a lot of connotations when you're speaking about Cuban culture, uh, when you're talking about uh, Yoruba culture, Abacua and 
orishas. There's also mambo in Nigeria. So for the Dominican Republic, mambo is something very specific that refers to a particular kind of merengue that has been modernized with a kick drum. So those are the three that are the most recognizable in the industry. However, there's tons of others that are not recognized in the industry, but you speak to a Dominican person living in Santiago or in San Pedro de Macorís, and they'll tell you like, oh, there's also mangulina, um, mangulina, merengue de guitarra, uh, jaleo, carabiné, salves, balsies, what else do we have? Mambo Alibaba. Um, and then there are a couple of other rhythms that are not necessarily merengue, like you wouldn't necessarily maybe dance them with a partner, but they're merengue, uh, they're influenced the same way that merengue was in, and they have the, a similar BPM often. Um, one of those is Alibaba, which I mentioned, and Gaga, which is also based on the Haitian rhythm, Raga. So when you're listening to those two rhythms, oftentimes if you play them in a party, in Dominican party, people will dance merengue to it because of how similar it is. And then within Mambo, uh, you have another family tree. So you have Mambo Urbano, Mambo Callejero, Mambo Electronico, Mambo Acelerado. And all of these just refer to different BPMs in the Mambo sphere. So a Mambo Acelerado would be the fastest one. Mambo Callejero would be like your Omega, Alahasa. Mambo Electronico would be like um, Ruben del Rio, El Mezclador, which is like merengue with a, a lot of synthesized instruments. And this one is also very popular in, the, in Puerto Rico, uh, and they call it secuencia, which is used for musica like guajira, merengue guajira, bachata guajira. But a lot of these rhythms, again, are not recognized by a music industry. This would be more like the talk of the town. Remember what we said about the dance floor split at social and merengue plays? Perhaps this is because some people aren't sure about what the music is or how to dance it. We asked Edwin to help some folks out. For someone who knows nothing about merengue, how would you describe how it's danced? It's a highly sensual, grounded dance. And that grounded uh, denotes the fact that it comes from an, a heavy African influence and a very mild um Arawak or Taino influence with the standardizations of, you know, European music, meaning how the music is recorded, how the music is played, how the music is written in terms of notation. All of that standardization comes from its European uh, influence. And in the dance, because it's a sensual dance, there is a lot of energy exchange between the partners. So uh, merengue has a lot of hip movements, a lot of hip swing. Um, which is something that's also very native to the music of Haiti and Dominican Republic, both combined, um, that wasn't found in Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and Cuba, as the dances in those countries tended to uh, be a little bit more formal and salon-like, right up until maybe Son. Son uh, was kind of like the, the break away from the formal. Um, merengue has a lot of um, grounded steps that can be also lifted, meaning the ball of the foot is is rare, but it's found. However, it's mostly often flat-footed. It's a very flat dance, though, compared to like dances in in ballroom and in the salsa world, where we tend to be a little bit more lifted and on the ball of the feet of the foot. Um, the turn pattern uh, incorporated into merengue, but merengue wasn't initially a turn pattern based dance. It was literally just uh, grinding the the lower half of your body, and then the turns became kind of like the the ways that people started to make it more acceptable because now you didn't have to be connected the entire time. And when Trujillo was still around, merengue dancing was very popular in the salons, but there was more space between the couples than what you would find today and before Trujillo. <laughs> Um, another really fun fact about merengue is uh, a lot of people give cre a lot of credit to turn patterns in salsa because salsa revolutionized it and popularized it. But merengue was the first, also the first Afro-Caribbean dance that incorporated turn patterns where um, where you're holding hands while turning someone else. Um, and now we see how popular this is in timba, 
in Rueda de Casino, in Salsa. However, Merengue was the one who first took that risk of introducing these turns. And it was not very accepted back then. So if you're speaking to my mom's, you know, parents, like grandparents, they'll probably tell you, like, en, la, en el merengue no se da vuelta. You don't turn in merengue. Um, but if you ask my mom and her contemporaries, her peers, of course you turn in merengue. That's what adds all the flavor. That's what adds all the fun. So I think it's also a very generational question, like, depending on who you ask. Merengue has so many flavors. Musically speaking, what differentiates Tipico from all the other rhythms? I also want to take this opportunity to distinguish also Merengue Tipico is often uh, called Perico Ripiao. Merengue, <laughs> this is a joke that we have because Merengue, uh, even though people recognize it as the rhythm from the Dominican Republic, Sometimes you have to be even more specific and not say that merengue is Dominican, but merengue is cibaeño. Merengue is from El Cibao. Because El Cibao, it's, it's almost like its own country. The amount of black culture in El Cibao is just amazing. Like when you go to a bate in El Cibao, it's very different than a bate in the cities of, like my city in San Pedro or in the, the capital. So what makes merengue typical slash quote unquote perico ripiao distinct from everything else is its minimalistic sound. Um, in a merengue típico, you have acordeón, guira, tambora. That's it. Perico ripiao, even though the words often are used interchangeably, Perico ripiao is a little bit more descriptive of a merengue típico. So it's like a uh, merengue típico is like an umbrella and Perico Ripiao is one of the variants. So the Perico Ripiao would have uh, saxophones often um, to be doubled with the accordion. Often you have tamboras and congas. So now you have an extra set of deep African uh, influence in the merengue music. It already had it with the tambora, but with the congas, it even adds a little bit more depth to it. Um, so typical would be the, both the umbrella and the minimalistic sound. Uh, of those three instruments, accordion, guiri, tambora. However, there's also merengue tradicional, which is uh, a word that's only used usually in the older community, like people 50 and higher uh, and, and older would say merengue tradicional, which would be another brand of típico that is the original uh, setting of a merengue, which was guitar, guira, and tambora, no accordion, because the accordion came much later into the island. <music> We've heard a lot about Perico Ripiao. What does that even mean? If any Spanish person hears Perico Ripiao, the Spanish translation would be stripped parrot. So Perico or would be the beak of a parrot. And Ripiao would mean strip. So ripea eso, strip that. However, in the Dominican Republic, Perico Ripiao is slang. The word ripio is also the body part of a boy, you know, of a young boy. Uh, so sometimes they'll say, like, mira ese ripio, limpiate tu ripio. That means clean your part, buddy. Perico ripiao also has a lot to do with the way that merengue is danced, which is guayando la villa, and the villa is the belt buckle. So you have to almost, like, connect your pelvis to someone else, which is going back a little bit, Andres and Melissa, to the beginning of, of the podcast when I was talking about the merengue being a taboo at the time because it introduced this idea of getting close to someone. Merengue was the first Afro-Caribbean Latin dance or Afro-Caribbean dance that included uh, partnering in close position. Prior to merengue, we had Habanera, of course, in Cuba, in the Contradanzas, in Haiti. Um, you know, you had Tumba. But none of these were partner dances. They were all court dances where women and men were separated. So there was like a very patriarchal dance society. They were separated and they were not allowed to touch one another. Merengue was the one that revolutionized that idea of hold my hand, let's do this. So coming back to strip parrot, it literally just means grinding together, like grinding la guayando la villa. Um, however, the word perico ripiao uh, predated the music and the, the dance. <laughs> 
In our Afro-Cuban and Samba episodes, we saw that the movement associated with these rhythms have origins in slavery and religion. We asked Edwin if there is a similar relationship with movement in merengue dancing. One of the roots of merengue is palos, you know, palos atabales, which if you listen to palos in Dominican Republic and you listen to palos in Abacua cultures or, or in Cuba, you're listening basically to the same exact music. The, the way that the dancers portray those movements is very different. Oftentimes in Cuba, you have palo rhythms and, and palo has a lot of chest movements. It's all about chest, 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 and then lighter on the steps, but it's still grounded. And in palo, you have all sorts of different arm movements that are coming from the chest in Cuba. In Dominican Republic, palo, which is one of the, the, the key ingredients of merengue, palo is also very chest driven. So you see, uh, yo soy olumbare, yo, y vengo, and you see all these movements side to side, but all the times the dancers are doing this movement of back and forth, contracting and, and releasing. And that's a rhythm and a movement that's still found in today's merengue. That rhythm of side to side, that swinging, where people often perceive it as window washing because they think it's this, it's actually coming from the chest and the isolation of that chest coming in and out without the head going forward and back. But it looks to someone like, oh, they're moving their heads forward and back. And it's, you know, it's like one of those uh, misconceptions. That's one of the biggest influences of merengue that's coming from the Palo community. And the reason I want to mention Palo and Atavales is because this is part of our, if, if you have, two branches of Joruba, Joruba land, um, you know, Nigerian, Congo, Benin, um, any of those countries where the, the enslaved people were brought from into the San, uh, early day Santo Domingo, um, you have the branch of Santo Domingo and, and Saint Domingue, Porto Prince, in Haiti and Dominican Republic. So when you look at the religious or ceremonial uh, voodoo cultures or, or gaga music, Gaga rhythms, even though they're ceremonial and oftentimes very sacred, like um, it's still really hard to find a video of what uh, a haha looks like in Haiti. So with Gaga and Rara, what we see on videos and YouTube videos, what becomes popular is the 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 movements that are the most eye opening. But then there's so many other things that maybe might be seen like taboo to people. Like, oh, why are they doing that? Why are they looking like they're inhibiting spirits? Well, because they actually might be. Uh, part of these ceremonies was a medium of communication between the earth and the higher, the, the divine powers, which depending on what Yoruba uh, religion or tradition you're talking to, if it's Cuba, um, Dominican Republic, or Haiti, it might be a different energies out in the universe. And in the beginning, they had to be almost codified and, and, and hidden, masked with uh, Catholicism in order for that religious gathering to be preserved over time. But when you look at the deep root of African culture in the Caribbean, this is where you start getting your voodoo, your gaga, your palos, your guloyas, uh, cocolos from San Pedro, which is like one of the oldest traditions of, of black co uh, cultural celebration in, in my town, San Pedro de Macorís. And that word cocolo became a whole other thing a whole, uh, it, it took on a whole other connotation outside of the Caribbean, which almost became like a taboo to be called the Cocolo. But in the Dominican Republic, specifically in San Pedro, when you say Cocolo from San Pedro, like Juan Luis Guerra song, Cocolo from San Pedro, what you're saying is you're keeping the memory of the Cocolos alive. You know, the Cocolo people were uh, the, the darkest tone, the darkest skin tone that you can find because these were the, the untouchables. The Europeans didn't want to mix and, and rape and inseminate the untouchables. So they became a whole separate society. And over the years, that became the identity of black people in the Dominican Republic, which is similar to the entire country of Haiti. In Haiti, that blackness was so embraced that it became intertwined with culture. In the Dominican Republic, there's often that resistance. So 
everything, every single dance and st- uh, movement that we do in merengue is coming from something much earlier. Like I, I can even think of the, the main step in merengue, your basic step. When you're learning it outside of the Dominican Republic, it's almost taught like a march. And a march has even beats. In Dominican Republic, when you look at merengue dancers, specifically in Cibao and any of the regions that have a lot of black people, you have a strong accent, which is where the word tumbao comes in. Tumbao is an accent on one side. You drop un tumbao, me voy a caer because you're falling over. So the tumbao became the dominant force behind dancing merengue. And you can kind of get hints of that in merengueros when they dance bachata. You can get little hints of that drop, that tumbao. And the tumbao, there's like two different accounts for how the tumbao had come to be in the Caribbean. It was the, the way that the enslaved people were shackled together. They had to literally feel almost like they're dragging the force of everyone else with them. Even though everyone's walking at a somewhat similar pace, every person felt the extra carry of someone behind. Like you had to almost carry on another weight with you. And that created a natural accent on one foot. So if we know how transgenerational trauma works and all the intricacies of it, you can imagine how that kind of accent over time, when people started developing their music and their dance, is going to carry from one generation to another. And even today, you see dancers with that accent. Merengue often has that one-sided, heavy accent, one uh, left or right. That's one of the things that I feel like it's the untold truth about merengue, how black it is, you know, then goes back to like our enslaved ancestors. Um, the other account was uh, that the limp could be coming from the way that a soldier was coming back from Talanquera from that final batter, battle in the Dominican Republic, and he was injured. So in honor of the battle of Talanquera, a lot of people were dancing like that general who, who walked with a limp. I don't know how much I believe it. I prefer the, the shackled enslaved people because it's all also shows that side of resilience that we can make so many beautiful things from our dark and painful history. Edwin is very informed and steeped into black and indigenous culture. It is clear, as he spoke with us, just how much time he has spent to understand this rhythm beyond what he learned culturally as an Afro-Dominican. As he talked to us about how to understand the music, we wonder how his explicit integration of the black contribution to merengue is received among his peers and contemporaries, and in the industry in general. I can tell that not a lot of our peers want to hear about the blackness of our music and culture, um, including people who look like me, who are from the Dominican Republic. And maybe not because of ignorance or because they don't want to know or because they don't want to talk about it, but because possibly this could be perceived as, uh, they might be perceived as less marketable because we have to face it. You know, what is more marketable in our society is flashy, sensualized, overly sexualized attire, like proper attire, whatever that is. I've I've seen organizers that tell us like, uh, hey, can you send us a, a photo for our promotion? And I don't dress like your typical bachatero. And oftentimes, you know, you got the, the tight pants with the, with the hat, you know. <laughs> and it's become almost like an image of the bachatero. Like, I've even seen memes like the bachatero starter kit. If you've seen me, like, I don't dress anything like on a regular day. And I rarely re- dress like that for events. You know, ever since the movement behind George Floyd, I've almost refused to cater to the image of something that I'm not trying to sell. So unless it's necessary... I'm going to dress the way I normally dress. You know, I I started to lock my hair last year and I'm not going to release my locks for no events, no matter how much they they beg, whatever the the reasoning is for it. You know, it's something that I feel that even I've propelled that that image, you know, there's the image that we propel that is not the cultural blackness that you see in the Caribbean. It's the 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 sugar-coated blackness. Like, yeah, bachatero, dale moreno, dale negrita. That's the, the sugar-coated blackness. For me, the real blackness is what, what Haitian experience in the Dominican Republic, what a lot of my Haitian brothers and sisters experience there. That's the blackness that I'm talking about, the, where, where people are shot, murdered, lynched, oppressed, and taken advantage of because of the skin color. 
which a lot of people in the, the Caribbean and the Dominican Republic will never know what that feels like or will never know what that looks like because to them it's like, oh, that doesn't happen anymore. That was back in Trujillo's days. And that doesn't, come on, man. I have, all my best friends are Haitian. You know, I love Guyar and, and Compa. But what are we doing when we see the oppression? That's the key. That's where I feel like the, the, the blackness gets to be manifested. Socrates, John, and Edwin have given us so much to think about. Given what they've shared, we wanted to get back to the cornerstone of this season. At a minimum, what should people who engage in this rhythm know about its Black roots? Merengue is in, in, inherently a, a African, has a very big influence of African music. Like pretty much all of our music's in our, our you know, uh, in the Caribbean. So I would say if people acknowledge that and don't try to put it aside, I think that, that will help. If people know about the instruments and their origins, even the rhythms of their origins, I think that will help. Uh, now, I think if you don't deny what the, what, what the music is about, what the music was about, where, where the music came from, that will help. When we end each interview, we ask our guest if there is something we've missed. Edwin wanted to take an opportunity to deliver a message he felt would resonate with listeners. And I'm not lying to you, he ends up running an uncompensated, unpaid ad for the Where You Listening series. Maybe a message I would, I would like to leave. And well, there was a group, Fulanito, that was really popular in the 90s. Guayando. <laughs> Yeah, that song. If an event hires us for bachata and we don't get an opportunity to teach merengue, we'll at least use that song to either close our class or open our class, you know, just to keep people thinking. Specifically, if you know the song specifically, mm -hmm. that second verse says so much about the Caribbean. It misses a few points or, or it, it distorts a few points, but it's so powerful for people to hear. Fulanito was trying to wake us up and we were just having so much fun that we didn't hear that en el 1492 vino un tipo que dijo que descubrió la quisqueya mía, Ave María, Gerarejía yeah, con eso. Yeah. Taíno, indio, caribeño. It's like keeping the story of our indigenous people and our African ancestry alive in our music in a way that people are dancing through it and not realizing, like, wait a minute, this is, this is deep. I believe that all of these songs that you hear, merengues and sometimes salsa too, that are highlighting black culture, and letting you know that these things were happening uh, before and they'll probably happen still and they'll probably continue to happen for as long as we continue to uphold those systems. So I want to make sure that people, when they're learning about merengue or learning merengue or, or listening to merengue, really listen to the words. When you start to really listen, you figure that the entire universe is trying to talk to you. We just don't want to hear it. Also, I wanted to like um, make sure that whoever's listening out there specifically the black community and black indigenous community. Bachata, salsa, merengue, compa, uh, any of our rhythms in the Caribbean, reggae, reggaeton, ska, anything of any uh, bomba plena, it's all black music. It's all black. You know, and I, I think, of course, there's indigenous factors, there's European factors, but black is the one that we tend to suppress the most. That's the identity we tend to forget about the most. And I just want to make sure that people understand merengue is a lot of things. Black is the, the root of merengue. Own it, specifically if, if you ever felt disconnected from it because not being of the Caribbean or not being Latino or not being black, uh, uh, the Dominican black or Afro-Dominican, it's all the same to me. It's all one and the same. I, I think if those enslaved people weren't brought to the island, then maybe we can have a different conversation. I 
I love that Edwin ends with that. If those enslaved people weren't brought to the island, then maybe we can have a different conversation. This is the exact reason why we have to have these conversations. Because black history and black contributions to these rhythms, particularly merengue, is a part of our story and the part that people can quite easily choose to forget. It's funny you say that because last weekend I had a shot of motivation for our work. Just last Saturday, I had just arrived to a social when the DJ started playing that merengue that Edwin talked about, Guayando by Fulanito. And the thing we talked about happened. I rushed to the dance floor, eager to dance the song, while other people waited it out. I've always loved this song, since the very first time I heard it. I know most of the lyrics by heart. However, having it played at a social as we were working to finish this episode was kind of magical because all that anti-racist work that we've done in the podcast, all that effort and resources we put into it, all of that came together with the joy of dancing we inherited from our ancestors. It just made sense. It added so much more dimension and joy to those three and a half minutes of my existence. And it motivated me to keep the grind going, to keep bringing those difficult conversations to the table in hopes that people might feel the same way at some point, as they understand better the culture and do the work to fight anti-blackness. What a blessing to be part of the African diaspora in Latin America. For sure, I feel the same exact way. Any music that comes up in social that has been featured in our seasons, singles, or in the Were You Listening series always reminds me of not only the meaning of the songs, but the work we do with the podcast. And I hope that listeners experience the same connection. I even love that my dad, who is a DJ with Vibe 24-7, has done a few sets using music from our playlist. Shout out to DJ R. Bazaar. Shout out! Your dad is really awesome. He's been so, so supportive of our work. I was so happy and humbled when he decided to use some of the music we've put together in our playlist for one of his sessions. Honestly, at this point, I think of our main playlist almost as a library. As we mentioned earlier, this rhythm is so nostalgic. I have a gem of a video from my childhood, actually, dancing merengue, that I will most certainly have to feature this month. I don't want to see your oh, yes, you do. ass no. dancing merengue. <laughs> it's so good! Even my cousin Marcus and his wife Stephanie sent me a video of them dancing merengue just a couple weeks before this episode. This rhythm is clearly an important part of our family's lives, and I'm so grateful for the contributions of Socrates, John, and Edwin. The way they've helped us to take this opportunity to create an episode that allows everyone who loves this music to understand it is more invaluable. Yeah, big big thank you to our guests, Socrates, John, and Edwin. They were so so thoughtful. We had so much fun in our interviews and we got to learn and reminisce a lot, which I loved. I hope you loved this episode when you listen as much as we do. Thank you for listening. This is Mixtape. Mixtape. Thanks for listening to today's episode. To listen to the songs featured in this episode and songs featured in other episodes, check out the Season 2 playlist, which can be found at our website, tarheels.live slash mixtape podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at mixtape.podcast, as well as Twitter and YouTube, which are easily accessed through our website. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications for all our new episodes. Have any suggestions, questions, or comments? Email us at themixtapepodcast at gmail.com. You can also send audio clips of your reflections to the content to be featured on our episode. Thanks for listening. This is Mixtape.